good morning, Central, and Happy New Year. It's good to see you, and I can't think of a better place to be than together with God's family, worshiping Him. So let's do just that this morning. I invite you to stand and worship along with us. I was buried beneath my shame. Is 
for just a few moments while you check out these announcements. Happy New Year! Isn't this a pretty cool way to start 2023? By gathering together to acknowledge the Lord's presence and dedicate ourselves to His teaching and mission in the year to come? If you are up late and feel your eyelids drooping, Hustle back behind me to our Welcome Center and get yourself a cup of coffee. This morning we have Pastor Brian sharing our message. And you don't want to be asleep when he shows a funny video or talks about how he posed as a realtor when he got texted by a wrong number. You don't want to miss it. I won't take too much of your time this morning, but just want to remind you that impact groups are an important way to incorporate many aspects of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. If you stop and think about it, the way Jesus did discipleship looked a lot like an impact group. It just had 12 guys in it, it lasted about three years, and they took lots of field trips together. So I can't urge you enough, if you want to know Jesus more, if you want to be more successful as a disciple maker this year, impact groups are a great way to do that, and it's easy to get plugged in. It's a growth opportunity that's just sitting there waiting for you. 
But I can't promise that what God does through your experience in a group will be easy. I expect that it will be good, but not necessarily easy. Things that are worthwhile require effort. And like a good father, our heavenly father uses discipline to grow us. So groups will demand something of you. And it's well worth the investment. So make your plans to be part of an impact group right now. That's right, take out your phone right now and head over to discovercentral.org backslash groups. And if you don't have a device with you, you're welcome to let us know your preferred group on a communication card. Lastly, it's not too late to make a gift toward our Christmas offering. Thanks to those of you who have already contributed. It's a helpful boost for what we're envisioning for the coming year. And these resources for our missionaries and for us to minister to others through our physical space are right at the heart of our trust in Jesus to transform people's lives. So it's an eternal investment. Let's make 2023 a great year. And there's no better way than by worshiping the Lord first and foremost. All right, let's go ahead and stand as we continue to worship together.
for this time to be together with your family this morning to worship you on this first day of the new year. God, we thank you for the things that you did last year. And Lord, we look forward to the great things that you're going to do through your people this year. And we're excited to be a part of it. God, I pray now that as we open your word, that you will open our hearts and minds to receive it. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Well, Happy New Year, Central. And with a new year comes new possibilities, new adventures. You know, I Googled, uh, what do people want in the new year? And, you know, you get the obvious answers. Oh, I want to exercise more. I want to get more organized. Well, if you keep scrolling down the list, you'll finally get to something that I want. And it says, for your team to win a championship. (laughs) Now, how many can amen to that? Okay. Have you ever been a part of a championship game, whether it was just your favorite sports team or maybe your fantasy football league or maybe you were actually in the game yourself? Well, there's been a few times when I've actually been in a championship game as a kid and uh, young adult and all that stuff, but one in particular comes to mind when I was 
around 10 years old, I was playing soccer for Craddock in the U12 league. So that means we were under 12, 9, 10, 11 year olds. And uh, we had a team and we were, we were decent. Okay, we were, we were okay. You know, we won some games, we lost some games, we were okay. But it was the end of the year, end of the season, time for the tournament, and we were in this tournament. But the problem is, is that there was this team that we played against in the regular season, and they were amazing, okay? They were super skillful, they, you know, they beat everyone, I think they had a perfect record, and they would always win by like five or six goals. Um, so they were, this was a really good team. So we get to the tournament, and you know, things happen, we play games, and we end up making it to the finals. And we're excited, but then we're also, you know, we're seeing the handwriting on the wall, we're seeing the future a little bit here, because Who's the other team? It's that team, okay? So, and not only were they like really, really good, but they were also like super cocky, so it was really annoying. Um, they, w throughout the tournament, they, we had this table set up and it had the first place trophies on it because this was the time before partic participation trophies. Not everyone got a trophy, it was just the first place team. So whenever anyone from that team would go up to the table, they'd be like, yeah, when I get this trophy, it's gonna go on with my mantle, and, uh, you know, and say all the plans that they have for the trophy that they're going to get. Because, you know, they were just so cocky about it. And then the icing on the cake was when we were uh, warming up. We were getting ready for the game. You know, we were on their, our side. They were on their side. And then a song broke out. They started singing, We are the champions. We are the champions. No time for, they pointed at us, losers. <laughs> Because we are the champions of the world. <laughs> These are kids. 9, 10, 11-year-old kids doing that to us. And you should know you don't do that before. You do it afterwards if you are the champions. Now, this made us pretty mad. And, you know, we didn't have, like, this epic movie-like huddle where we got together. And, Guys, we got to do something. You know, we didn't do any of that. But I think each of us kind of, we looked at each other and we're like, you know what? We're going to give 110% because... You know, this isn't right. We don't like this. So the game happened. We played. The game ended. And we ended up winning by two goals. So, yeah. Yay, Brian's team. Good job. <laughs> we ended up beating them. And they were just devastated. And their coach was livid. I think their coach was, like, even yelling at these kids and all this stuff. But and us, I think a song broke out on our end, if you, if you can know what song that is. But we were just on cloud nine, and we were just so excited. And I'm sure the other team was just like, how? How did this happen? Why did this happen? They had everything they needed to succeed, but it just didn't happen. And I'm sure there's times when we go through that, and we say, you know what? We go through life, something bad happens, and we say, how did this happen? Why did this happen? Or we might even say, why, God? Things don't work out the way they ask, and we say, why? It doesn't feel like God is in our corner sometimes. Why does this have to happen? Why do things feel this way sometimes? And with the new year, sometimes we hear this phrase that, you know what, in this year, in 2023, with God on my side, this is going to be all me. This is going to be all Brian this year. And you know, and that's great, and I love the confidence, but are we following the leading of God, or are we just making plans and asking God to bless it? And then when it doesn't work out the way that we want to, we blame him, and we say, God, why, you gotta, why do you got to go so hard? Like, come on, we're, we're buddies. Why do you got to do that? So I trust that as we open up God's word this morning, this first Sunday of 2023, we'll see the dangers of trying to use God the way that we see fit instead of allowing him to use us the way that he sees fit. So we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 4, starting out in verse number 1. And it says, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. And the Philistines drew up in line against Israel. And when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh, and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who was enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. So the Israelites at this point, they've been through it. 
they've seen their share of amazing things, but they've also had their share of difficulties. And most of that is because of their own doing, because of their lack of faith or their disobedience. And this passage is one of those times that fall in the lack of faith or disobedience category. And you would think that after everything they've seen God do, that they would have this close relationship, this devotion to him. But that's not the case. They kept turning their back on him. Now they find themselves about to battle against one of their main enemies and would be for a long time until David, King David, would uh, defeat the Philistines later on in the, t- in the period of kings. But the Philistines were all about expansion. They wanted to expand their territory. They came in from the west to the opposite side of Canaan, and this meant conflict with the Israelites. So this was a serious threat to anyone who opposed the Philistines. And to set up the geography a little bit, the Philistine camp, it says it's over there uh, at the, near the Yarkon River at Aphek, and then the Israelites are over in Ebenezer. So that's about two miles away from each other. So this battle starts... The Israelites went out to battle against the Philistines. Philistines drew up against Israel. And before we get any further, we got to ask, how do we get into this situation here? Why are they battling and how did God allow this to happen? Well, to answer that question, we need to go back a few chapters. We could read chapter 2 and chapter 3 in their entirety. And I recommend you do that. A lot of good information in there. But we're just going to skip around just so that we get the gist of what's going on here. So we're going to start in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse number 12. It says, now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Okay, problem number one. Worthless men were leading at, the point, at this point. So there's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. They were officiating priests at the time. And then Phinehas actually became the, the high priest once Eli was too old to do his duties. And when the wicked are in charge, things tend to end poorly. Let's keep reading. We're going to skip down to verse number 22. It says, now Eli was very old. And he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil doings from all these people. No, my sons, it is no good to report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. And then verse number 34, And this that shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, shall be the sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. And then jumping down to chapter 3, verse number 11. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel, at which two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli and all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever, for the iniquity that he knew because of his sons were blaspheming God, and, they did, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So why are we in this mess? It's because of these two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. These were the priests. They were corrupt. And when leadership is corrupt, it tends to corrupt the people sometimes. And Eli was a good high priest, but because of his lack of correction for his sons, they were in this situation. There's, these sons were stealing from God. They were disrespecting them. They were living immorally with the uh, women at the temple. And all of Israel would have to pay for the sins of a few people. And this is something that we need to remember because in the midst of our sinning, yeah, we feel that guilt and we feel that shame. But sometimes we say to ourselves, you know what? It's just, it's just me that I'm affecting. I, I'm, only, I'm only affecting myself. I'm only hurting myself. But that's not true because our sins will make those around us suffer. It might be your kids. It might be your relationships. It might be other family members. Even if it's a secret right now and it's not affecting anybody right now, it will because it will come out into the light and people will be effect- affected. And what's something that always happens is that it always affects more people than we realize. And in the case of Hophni and Phinehas, their sins would lead to the deaths around 34,000 people And the poor leadership trickled down to the elders, too. If we look in verse number three, it says, And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So this was the elders' idea to bring this Ark into the camp. They were trying to think through the easiest path to success. And they put their faith in things rather than faith in God. 
And they're looking to the ark to save them, not for the Lord to save them. And it sounds like it might be a good idea because it's kind of forcing God's hand here. It's kind of twisting his arm to saying, you know what? You're on our side. They know that you're on our side. This is your chance to win the battle because your honor is kind of at stake here, God. So it's almost like they're tempting him a little bit. And this just seemed like this was the best course of action to kind of put God under pressure to deliver a win here. And, you know, we try this too. We put our faith in things other than God. And even here in the church, there's times when we put our faith in a program and say, you know what, if we don't have that program, then how is God going to work? Or, you know, there's things when we go out in the name of church instead of the name of Jesus. And we think we go out and we have these awesome spiritual conversations, but all we're doing is going out in the name of church, which it's good to go out as a church and to do things and impact the community, but in the name of Jesus. So we go out and we have our conversations and there's the, the cashier as we're checking out and say, hey, do you have a church building that you go to? And then she says yes. And then we say, oh, awesome. Praise the Lord. Or as she says, no, hey, she come to mine. And then we're like, did my spiritual conversation. Oh yeah, did it. But that's going out just in the name of church instead of going out in the name of Jesus and have those impactful conversations. But you might say, you know what? Hey, this is, this is different though. This is the Ark of the Covenant we're talking about. And just to give a little bit of backstory on the Ark, it's not just something from Indiana Jones movies. This is something that is actual, uh, an actual Ark of the Lord and it signifies God's presence with his people. And the Ark of the Covenant, it was this uh, gold-covered box, and inside of it was manna, Aaron's rod, and copies of the Ten Commandments. And it was always in the most holy place, or the Holy of Holies, unless it was on the move in the wilderness, if the Israelites were on the move. But not to be confused, this box is not God. God is not stuck in this box, and this box is not to be worshipped. But they probably thought, you know, we can bring this Ark of the Covenant into battle because they've seen success with the Ark of the Covenant nearby. If they go back to when the Jordan River was parted, hey, you know what? The Ark of the Covenant was there. If they think back to when the walls of Jericho fell down, hey, you know what? The Ark of the Covenant was there. So they're starting to be a little bit confused that maybe possibly the Ark of the Covenant did those things and uh, that they did all those incredible events. But they needed a confidence boost, and they knew for sure that God would be with them if they brought this ark into battle with them. And that's the focus of this chapter here, because it mentions it 12 times in this chapter. And not only is it a sign of God's presence, but it's also a sign of God's power. And the elders were right in realizing they needed God's power to win the battle, but here's the mistake they made. The mistake that they made was that they mistake the symbol of God's presence, the ark, for his actual presence. They mistake the symbol of God's presence for his actual presence. And there's times when we might see this, when we see that uh, it looks like this is a place where uh, God is alive and well and doing amazing things, but then upon further investigation, man, there's, there's no signs of God being doing anything in this area. So don't mistake the symbol of God's presence for his actual presence. The Bible says that there is salvation in no one else, and there's no name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. But the elders, they were kind of confused by this. You know, they would try to make God work for them and give them the victory. And they said in verse number three, why has the Lord defeated us? This is all God's fault, right? And, you know, we struggle with that too, blaming God for the disasters that happen in our life. And uh, instead of just taking the time, just uh, taking the time and just looking at our own hearts and realizing if there's any sin in our lives. And you know what? That might not even be the case. There's times when bad things happen and we're just a part of it with no wrongdoing of our own. And my broad answer on that is just because there's sin in the world. We live in a sinful, fallen world, and sometimes things outside of our control happen to us. But that was not the case for this situation. The question that the elders asked showed that they had a clear understanding that the Lord fought their battles. But instead of repenting and getting on their faces and just uh, submitting to God, they blame him. So let's keep reading and see what happens in our story here. Verse number five. As soon as the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of shouting, they said, what does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. For they said, a God has come into the camp. 
And they said, woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us, who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Israelites just lost 4,000 men, and instead of retreating, they attempt to rally back. And they are desperate, and they go to Shiloh, they bring the Ark of the Covenant to the battlefield, and they encourage the, the Israelites, and they try to frighten the Philistines. And they probably thought they were even better than the Philistines, thinking that these pagans, this is what these pagans are getting, but not even realizing that they're acting as pagans as well, trying to use God and trying to manipulate God and forcing him and doing what they wanted him to do. It's a little bit like a scene from a movie. It's like, okay, our heroes, they just lost 4,000 men. What do we do? They bring in the secret weapon, and the enemy is scared. They're on, on the ropes, and it looks like our heroes are going to win. But the problem is, is that this isn't a movie. This is real life, and God's not amused being a mascot or a lucky rabbit's foot. And uh, they, the Israelites were just certain that they were going to win at this point. It's like they were singing a song. We are the... No, I won't do it again. <laughs> they were certain. They were certain that they were going to win at this point. And their shouts maybe didn't sound like that, but their shouts were enough to make the earth rumble, to make the earth shake in that area. So an earthquake happened because of their excitement for the Ark of the Covenant entering the battlefield. So the only modern example I can think of that kind of relates to this is the beast quake. Now, Football fans might know what I'm talking about, but if not, back in January of 2011, there was an NFL playoff game between the Seahawks and the Saints, and the running back on the Seahawks, Marshawn Lynch, he did a 67-yard touchdown where he broke nine tackles, meaning he just got people off of him that were trying to tackle him, and when he got into the end zone, the whole crowd just went crazy, and this was 66,000 people. They were so excited to have, have a touchdown and see this incredible play. They shouted, and a literal earthquake happened. It registered as a magnitude one or a magnitude two earthquake. And that's a little bit similar to what happens here, but in our story, there's about half that number of people that were shouting at this point at the ark's arrival to make the ground shake. And there was even a possibility, because we know that Ebenezer and Aphek were about two miles away, there's a possibility that it resounded and shook for about two miles. So you can hear it, you can feel that. Not 100% not sure on that, but there's a possibility. So the story is set for the good guys to win and for the bad guys to lose. Let's see how it plays out right here in the end. Verse number 10. So the Philistines fought... And Israel was defeated, and they fled every man to his home, and there was a very great slaughter, for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died, just as God had said. So, I mean, did we read that right? It just doesn't, doesn't seem like that should be the ending. Like, they had God on their side. They had, the, they had the ark. Couldn't they have used it as a good luck charm? The Israelites were so pumped, and the Philistines were so scared. Like, how does this happen? Well, the Israelites, or the Philistines, confused their enthusiasm for faith. And they had two main reactions the Philistines did. They were fearful, but then they had this vigorous determination to defeat Israel. And they were energized to do that because they said, you know what? I don't want to be slaves. Do you want to be slaves? I don't want to be slaves. Let's do this. And what's crazy is that the Philistines seemed to know a little bit more about God than the Israelites do at this point. They have a fear of the ark. They have knowledge of their history and knew that the ark of the covenant represented the presence of God. They knew the God of Israel had defeated the Egyptians and used plagues to do so. Now, granted, their theology was a little bit not great because as you can see in the text, they use the lowercase g and they also use it in the plural because they don't really have the concept of monotheism, uh, meaning multiple God or one God. They think of everything as multiple gods. But this shows that the mere rumor of God and his works can fill the ungodly with fear. It says in Romans 1.20, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived 
ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. So God convinces even the unbelievers of his majesty, so they are without an excuse. And you may look at this story and think, Man, why would God operate this way? I mean, didn't, don't you think they like showed a little bit of faith, the Israelites, just with that ark? I mean, there was a little bit of faith there, right? Well, no, that wasn't faith. It was superstition. And when we operate this way, our concern is not to seek God, but to control him, not to submit to God, but to use him. And we're not interested in success, or we're only interested in success, not in repentance. Now, you might have your own thoughts about superstition, or you just might be, as uh, Michael Scott says, a little stitious when it comes to things like, I'm not going to wash my favorite jersey because I hope the team hears about it and they play better and they win, things like that. But we are sometimes superstitious in our approach to God. You know, we do the act and we hope it helps. We say, hey, I'm here at the church building. I I came to services. I, I gave my tithe. I prayed. I sang the songs, you, you, well, my lips were moving, at least, and uh, we do those things, and we think, okay, I held up my end of the bargain, your turn, God. And, you know, we might not verbalize those thoughts, but sometimes we think them when things get out of hand. And although the Israelites didn't even hold up their end of the bargain in this case, their corrupt leaders are enough for things to end the way that they did. And, you know, what? they thought the ark was the ace in their sleeve, but they activated the Philistines' flight or fight response. And there's something about being backed up against the wall into a corner when you got no other choice, and then you have a choice, fight or flight. You can fight and stay, or you can run away and be scared. But uh, as the Philistines say in their words, they were men and they fought. They weren't going to go down with a fight. And the presence of the ark doesn't make them feel like giving up and said, you know, we got to even try harder. we got to give 150% because we're going up against a God here. So let's be men and let's fight. And the devastation was terrible. They said 30,000 foot soldiers. So the total we have now is 34,000 people that have died. And it says foot soldiers here because this was the time before chariot armies. That would come later on in uh, Solomon's reign. So it's talking about foot soldiers here. And the story continues on after this, but this ending just kind of makes us feel uncomfortable because it's not the ending we were expecting or the ending that we even wanted. But when you have sin in your lives and you try to manipulate God, it's not going to end well. And we try to convince ourselves, you know what? I'm going to be that one. I know sin always comes out into the light for other people, but I'm going to be that one that gets away with it. You won't. And you can't use God for your own benefit. We aren't to use him. We're to worship him and serve him and allow him to use us. So in the end, the Philistines captured the ark. It looks like they won, but God wasn't happy with that. And wherever the ark was among the Philistine people, he would curse them with tumors. So one place would get it, and then they would get tumors, and they'd be like, here, take this. And the other place would get tumors, and they said, no, we don't want this. You take this. And the other place would get tumors. Happened five times until they said, you know what? Let's just give it back to the Israelites. So then it went back to Israel. So as we wrap things up this morning, I just don't want us to miss the dangers of performing these same actions that the Israelites did. You know, God will not be used, but he will be glorified and not used for the glory of his people. So we're not to trot Jesus out as a mascot and use him as a good luck charm. You know, we need Jesus. We're privileged to be used by Jesus. And Israel's deliverance from the Philistines came only later on as they repented and they wholeheartedly turned back to God. And it wasn't because of the ark moving, but it was because of their hearts moving that gave them true freedom. And that's the same for us. I'm not sure what everyone's dealing with here, but I do know that repenting and turning to God is where healing and restoration begins. And Jesus is the one that gives us that freedom that nobody else can do. You know, it doesn't mean things will be smooth sailing. You can serve Jesus for your whole life for years and years, and then a storm comes. Does that mean it's time to quit because he's not useful anymore? He's not doing what I want him to do? Or do we long for that presence of God? Or do we just say, you know what, he's he's outlived his usefulness. Um, I'm going to make the God of my own choosing that makes my life better. But I don't know about you guys, but that's not not what I signed up for. I don't want to use God. I want to be used by God because he does incredible and amazing things. And if we lose sight of God's glory, it's going to be to our demise. So I want this year for me and for all of us just to be a year where we truly seek the Lord. Now, that might sound kind of broad, but what do I mean by seek the Lord? Well, here's three things we can begin doing if you haven't already started doing those things. 
Number one, put God first in your life. So no matter what happens around us, we are following God, we are listening to God, and we're having that intimate relationship with him that comes just from uh, walking with him, listening to him, and being eager to consult him at all times. Also, be reading God's word on a regular basis. And over time, we're going to grow in our understanding and knowing him and God's plan and our des- his desires for us. And then also asking the Holy Spirit to lead in our decisions. How often do we just turn to the Lord and say, okay, God, is this something that you want for me? Is this a, you, do I have your stamp of approval on this? And we just wait on the Lord and we ask and we ask until we get that answer, whether it's yes or no or wait, but asking the Holy Spirit to lead and guide our decisions. And not only that, but we need to expect God to show up, not in a way that the Israelites did. We expect God to fight this battle because we're forcing him, not in that way. But God, this is the God of the universe we're talking about here, but he's also a personal God. And we need to expect big things from God. He isn't a genie to grant our wishes, but he has done and he will do incredible things. So expect the unexplainable and uh, listen when he speaks. So when we seek the Lord, he's going to make himself known to us. He's forever accessible and available. And too often, we rely on our own power. But looking at the Israelites' example, hopefully we can stop doing that and rely on God. And we don't leave that spot of relying on God. We just be willing to show up and be used by him. So I'll end things today with this verse from Isaiah 43, 18 through 19. It says, God says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See that I am doing a new thing. So 2023 is going to be amazing. Don't spend too much time looking in the rearview mirror, but let's trust God to do some amazing things this year. Let's pray. God, we're just so thankful to be here today and just to be celebrating a new year, but God, let us not lose sight of the fact that you are holy and you are worthy. And uh, just forgive us of the times when we lose sight of that or the times when we put our faith in things or uh, people over you, God, and we're just uh, thankful to be used by you and uh, allow us to um, continue to seek you both in the good times and the bad times, not only when it's easy, but it's also when it's also hard, God. And uh, just let 2023 be a year of making disciples and uh, just making an impact out uh, in our communities, God. We love you and we thank you for all you do for us and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we close things up here today, I just wanted to uh, share a few announcements with you. Also, if another thing we could say about seeking the Lord is joining an impact group. Uh, you had the details earlier. You can go to discovercentral.org slash groups, and uh, that will help you uh, seek the Lord. So you won't regret it, um, and they start next week. So sign up for those. And then also, we start things. Our normal schedule is coming back, okay? So this Wednesday, we have uh, Team Kid, and we have Central Youth. And then uh, our services will be normal, the 9 o'clock and 10.30 service next week. So get out there. It's a new year. Let's share Jesus and impact people.